card is there's action, there's activity, there's transformation, there's life change, there's so many amazing things that God is doing. And I just love to come along and worship God with you and encounter God's presence. That's why we've come. And then for God to take us on to the next step and then to take us out through those doors and to see more victories than defeats during this week. Isn't that right? To see more victories than defeats. Now, Jill, I've known Jill for a long time, and she had no idea what I'm going to share with you tonight, but it so fits in. It's like we've we worked on this for weeks, uh, that Jill would be my link person into the sermon. And I, I'm going to share with you uh, the, parab- the, the story of the mustard seed, where Jesus healed the, the, the demoniac, and then ripped into his disciples and said, where's your faith? And then encouraged them and built them up. And I've got three words for you. Fear, failure, or faith. Fear, failure, or faith. And when you look at the mountain of difficulties that each one of us encounter, pastors aren't super people, I'm just like you. I don't escape the attack from Satan. I don't escape trouble and difficulty in my life. Uh, After all, I'm a pastor in the Rhonda, and the Rhonda has got 85,000 people that live there, and 0.9% of them as Christian. We live and minister in a very, very dark place. Fear, failure, or faith. When you look at the mountain in your life, what are you going to apply to it? Fear? When you look at the mountain in your life, whether it's a long-term difficulty, a long-term endurance battle, and I have to say exactly what Jill is saying, when someone has long-term difficulty, the church of Jesus Christ tends to uh, shun away from them. When people have short-term difficulty, everyone's with them, everyone's praying for them, everyone's blessing them, everyone's encouraging them, but if it goes on for longer than two weeks, the church begins to shun them. Or, if you get a bit better and then fall, get a bit better and then fall, get a bit better and fall, the church goes, oh, flipping heck, I'm not having too much to do with that person. Come on, let's travel the long journey with people. They might fail, they might be fearful, but you know, our faith in them can pick them up and take them to the place that God wants them to go. So, What do you do when you see the mountain in your life? Do you apply fear? Do you apply failure? Or do you apply faith? We're going to watch a short uh, couple of minute video and uh, and then I'm going to uh, give you the preach. Thank you. So coach, how strong is Westview this year? A lot stronger than we are. You already written Friday night down as a loss, Brock? Well, not if I know we could beat them. Come here, Brock. You too, Jeremy. What, am I in trouble now? Not yet. I want to see you do the death crawl again, except I want to see your absolute best. (laughs) (laughs) What, you want me to go to the 30? I think you can go to the 50. The 50? I can go to the 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you can do it with Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, I want you to promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. Okay. You gonna give me your best? I'm gonna give you my best. All right, one more thing. I want you to do it blindfolded. Why? Because I want you giving up at a certain point when you can go further. Get down. Jeremy, get on his back. I get a good tight hold, Jeremy. All right, let's go, Brock. Give your knees off the ground, just your hands and feet. There you go. A little bit left. A little bit left. I bet he does it. There you go, baby. There you go. Show me good effort. That way, Brock. You keep coming. There you go. It's a good start. A little bit left. A little bit left. There you go, Brock. Good strength. That's it, Brock. That's it. Another 20 yet? Forget the 20. You give me your best. You keep going. That's it. 
No. Don't stop, Brock. You got more in you than that. Hey, dude. I'm just resting a second. You got to keep moving. Let's keep moving. Let's go. Don't quit till you got nothing left. There you go. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Your very best. Your very best. Your very best. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. Don't quit on me. Keep going. Keep driving it. Keep, keep your knees off the ground. That's it. Your very best. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. That's it. You keep driving. Keep your knees off the ground. Keep driving it. Don't quit till you got nothing left. Keep moving, Brock. That's it. That's it. That's it. Keep going. I want everything you got. Come on. Keep going. It hurts. Don't quit on me. Your very best. Keep driving. Keep driving. There you go. There you go. He's heavy. I know I'm, he's heavy. I'm out of strength. Then you negotiate with your body to find more strength, but don't you give up on me, Brock. You keep going. You hear me? You keep going. You're doing good. You keep going. Do not quit on me. You keep going. It hurts. I know it hurts. You keep going. You keep going. It's all hard from here. 30 more steps. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Keep going. Burn. And let it burn. It hurts. It burns. It's all hard. You keep going, Brock. Come on. Come on. Keep going. You promised me your best. Your best. Don't stop. Keep going. It's too hard. It's not too hard. You keep going. Come on, Brock. Give me more. Give me more. Keep going. 20 more steps. 20 more. Keep going, Brock. Give me your best. Don't quit. No. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Brock Kelly, you don't quit. Keep going. Keep going. Go, Brock Kelly. You don't quit on me. No. You keep going. You keep going. Go, Brock. Ten more steps. Ten more. Ten more. Ten more. Keep going. Don't quit. Give me your heart. You can. You can. Five more, five more, come on, Brock, come on, don't quit, don't quit, come on, Brock, two more, one more. So will they. Oh, tell me you can't give me more than what I've been seeing. You just carried a 140-pound man across this whole field on your arms. Brock, I need you. God's gifted you with the ability of leadership. Don't waste it. Coach? Can I count on you? Yes. Yes. Coach? What is it, Jeremy? I weigh 160. watching that video all week, all week, I watch it every single day, because it inspires me, it encourages me, you see how often, and there are people that are in these, should be in these seats here, that have given up, that have quitted, that have applied fear to a problem, that have applied failure to a problem, and not applied faith, when you see the mountain, what do you do, let's get into God's word, if you've got a Bible, uh, open it up in Matthew chapter 10, um, when Jesus is, uh, is getting the 12 together. Uh, and I, I, I'm excited tonight because there's more than 12. When Jesus was here, uh, he got the 12 together. And what did he do? He sends out the 12. And he tells them to do certain things. Uh, we're going to be pretty quick on this. Uh, chapter 10 and verse 7. Jesus says, uh, verse 6, Jesus tells them to go to the lost sheep of Israel. Verse 7, as you go preach this message. When they go, they've got to preach a message. 
The kingdom of heaven is near. They've got to preach the kingdom, the message of Jesus. And then it, Jesus gives them this commandment. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received and freely give. I, I want to tell you that uh, the church in uh, Wales, perhaps even the church in the UK, has lost sight of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. The Church of Jesus Christ has lost sight of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. There are some people in this room here whose lives have been changed. If you weren't saved, you'd be dead. If you weren't saved, you'd be dead. And you'd be dead in hell. And you've been transformed by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing? I used to take drugs. I used to get in loads of trouble. I used to get into different scrapes and things. When I was 21, I gave my life to Christ. When we read passages like this, there are too many Christians that go, that was for yesterday. That was for yesterday. I tell you what, it's for now. There are people in this church here tonight that can be freed, that can be released, and that the, the mountains, the strongholds in your life, you can be freed from them. I'm looking around this church tonight. You're a beautiful congregation. You're a mishmash. You're from all different areas, different nationalities, different ages, from the very little to the elderly. It's amazing to have you, but some of you are carrying mountains on your back. You need to be freed from them tonight. And in this spiritual atmosphere, when we've worshipped, isn't your worship band amazing? The way they usher us into the presence of God. You see, if I started to preach at six o'clock, you'd be going, this ain't happening, John. This ain't happening. I'm not listening to you preach at six o'clock. The worship band begins to usher in the presence and power and anointing and authority of Jesus Christ into this place. There are people that at the end of this meeting, you're going to walk through those doors different to how you came in. Is this, is this a faith-filled atmosphere? Or is it a fear-filled atmosphere? Or is it an atmosphere of failure? It's a faith-filled atmosphere Amen. where transformation is going to occur. Jesus could have gone himself, but what did he do? He sent out 12. Do you know what's happening nowadays? In this earth, there are two billion Christians Imagine if Jesus had just done everything himself. A one-man band. Do you know what he did? He anointed and he gave authority to his disciples to go out, preach the kingdom, raise the dead, heal the sick, heal those with leprosy, and I give you authority over the demonic. Authority over the demonic. Don't be scared. We're not doing fear tonight. We're not doing failure tonight. We're doing faith. A couple of years ago, I was, uh, I, I was uh, a pastor in a church in Caldicott. And you know, in a Baptist church, you stand by the door and you shake people's hand. Hello, lovely to see you. A lady came in, and I didn't really know this lady. And she sat there and she, looked, she was scowling at me throughout the whole service. You know that look when someone's just looking at you as though, what on earth are you doing? And I shook her hand at the end of the service and had a chill go all the way through my body. And I looked into her eyes, and the whites of her eyes turned completely black. Completely black. There was a demon inside that lady. And I spoke to her husband, and I said, um, I think you might have some problems going on in, in your marriage. You know, tell me a little bit about it. And he looked at me straight in the eyes, and he said, virtually every day, she tries to kill me. This is in just an ordinary place called Caldicott's. Uh, virtually every day she tries to kill me. I said, well, you know, what, what does that look like? Well, she tries to take a knife out of the drawer and she tries to stab me. I said, look, I said, I think your wife's got a demon. Now, it's not an easy thing to say uh, to, to a married couple. It, it doesn't go down all that well. I said, I think your wife's got a demon. He said, I, I think there's something wrong with her too. But I wasn't really sure what it was. I said, well, we need to cast the demon out. 
<laughs> Not in my name, but in the name of Jesus. We take authority, don't we, in Jesus' name over the things of this dark world. I'm not powerful, but Jesus is, amen. The blood of Christ is powerful, isn't it? And we take authority over the demonic forces of this world, which have got control of probably 95% of the people in this country. So we were, I went in once a week on a Tuesday in the home. But you know what? Before I went in, I went watching daytime TV or on uh, Candy Crush or Facebook. Do you know what I was doing? I was fasting and praying and getting ready to go into battle. Come on, are we battle ready as a church? Are we battle ready as Christians? Because the demonic is out there. The demonic wants to take us down. The demonic wants to draw us back into the place in which we came from. Well, the disciples, oh, by the way, um, it went. The demon went. Because you're all thinking, what happened, aren't you? The demon went. <laughs> I, sometimes you've got you to hang on in there because it isn't always joined up uh, when I'm preaching. The demon went. Didn't go after the first week. Do you know, Christians, if something doesn't happen straight away, we give up? Didn't happen after the second week? I was panicking a bit, mind. I was thinking, she's trying to kill this guy every single night. It's got to go soon. Four weeks it took. And she was free. She became a member of our church. She gave her life to Christ. They had a happy marriage. Pictures of one another. We did a a special wedding blessing for them in the church. It was beautiful. Not about me. It's all about him. I got no power. He's got all the power. So this passage is pretty good. Imagine Jesus is saying to you, you've got to go and raise the dead. You've got to go and tell people about me. You, you, you've got to face the, the demonic. And we're going, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'll come into church and, and I'll, I'll, I'll sing and the beautiful band and I'll have a cup of tea and I'll listen to a guy preach or, and, and I'll sort of put up with all of that. No, we, we need to take authority when we go through those doors. This, this, is, this part is easy. What Jill said, when you're struggling, when you're up against it, when you're in the battle, not just one day, but for a year, two years, three years. It's what happens when you go through those doors. So what are we going to do with the mountains that we face in our lives? So if you flip over to Matthew chapter 17... And this is where it's all going to start to make sense. Because from Matthew 10 to Matthew 17, the disciples didn't... If you read those seven chapters, you won't see the disciples with Jesus a lot. So Jesus went to this place on his own. He went to that place on his own. He went to somewhere with John the Baptist. You won't see, um, you won't see Jesus with the 12 disciples because they're out on mission. They were out there doing it. But then it seems as though around Matthew 17, maybe just a touch before into 16, with Peter's confession of, of who Christ was, we see them starting to come back to Jesus. And then in Matthew 17, verses 14 through to 21, we see this beautiful account. That, and I'm going to read it because I, I, I love it. Do, do you, have we got time? Okay, great. When they came to the, when they came to the crowd... A man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. O oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here. Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. 
Then they came together in Galilee. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Now, chapter 10, the disciples were sent out. They were pumped. They'd had a praise party. They'd spent some time with Jesus. And Jesus said, go on, go on. And they were like, we're going. We're marching to Zion. And they were off on mission. Seven chapters later, they came back. And at the very end of this passage, they were filled with grief. Do you see how the emotion has switched here? And, and, and Jesus has rebuked them and said, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. I, I want to tell you that what we saw on the video is a picture of the coach is God. Go on. Go on. Don't quit. Don't give up. And the boy is a picture of us. He thought he could only go 20 metres. But you know, with the power and authority of God on his life, he could go the whole pitch. He could go the whole pitch. And there are people in this room tonight that think you can only go 20 metres. Or I think it was 20 yards in America. But I want to tell you tonight, that in the powerful anointing of God, you can go the whole pitch. You can go the whole pitch. You're not who you think you are. You're not who you think you are. You're not a product of your past. You're not a failure from this mistake. You're not fearful that this person will reject you or turn their back on you. You see, in verse 17, Jesus really does rip into the disciples. Because when Jesus is around, you've got to expect the supernatural. And I'm believing tonight that supernatural things are going to happen in this place. Jesus claims authority over the demon. And some of you are fearful of stepping up again. Some of you are fearful of going out again. Jackie and I, Jackie's my wife, we had a lovely time in Caldicott. Uh, I was pastor there for 17 years. They paid, uh, paid a salary. They paid my mortgage. They paid my pension. I had a lovely time there. It was really, really great. But the atmosphere of faith was beginning to dip in the church. And we were believing for less and for less and for less. And I really had to seek the Lord as to where we were going and what we were doing. And God spoke clearly to my wife and I, you're to leave and you're to go to the Rhonda. So I spoke to all the clever people that uh, plant churches and all of that. And they said, if you go, there's no finance, there's no support, you just go. So we sold our house, left the church, left the comfort and security of what we knew to step into the plans and purposes of God. I have to say that in the last year and a half since that happened, our faith has risen. Our fears and failures of the past have diminished. And the anointing of God in the atmosphere of faith has increased. In the last couple of weeks in the Rhonda, we've seen three, if not four, under 20s give their life to Christ. It's, it, all the glory goes to him. It's not about us. We're, we're in an environment where 0.9% of people are Christian. And young people under 25 is 0.09% of the young people of the Rhonda have given their lives to Christ. We are virtually the only church in the whole of that environment that has any young people in at all. Jesus took authority over the demon. And I want tonight to empower you to take authority over areas of your life 
that you consider to be a mountain. You see, Jesus said to them, O ye of little faith, which means you haven't got much faith. And I'd ask you tonight, controversially, where's your faith? Where's your faith? What are you believing God is going to do? It doesn't take faith to live in a warm house in Newport. Sorry. It doesn't take faith to come into this church. No one's going to shoot you or kill you for coming in here. I don't think. <laughs> they might nick your car. Did anyone come in a, a silver BMW? <laughs> it's just going past there. <laughs> doesn't take faith to come into a warm building. Sing praises together. I want to ask you, Jesus said to the disciples, you've got such little faith, you can't even move a mountain. You can't even change a situation or a circumstance. So I'm going to ask you tonight, what are you believing for? What are you sacrificing so that God can work in this area, in your life and in your environment? Are you caught up in fear? Are you caught up in failure? Are you worried what other people will think? Are you worried what your family will think? What your work colleagues will think? It don't matter anymore. None of that stuff matters. There's only one thing that matters in life. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. It's the only thing that will last. If Wales had have won the rugby match yesterday and they'd have had downward pressure. They needed some more downward pressure. Well, I'm, I'm believing that we need some more upward praise. Not more downward pressure. We've got enough stuff going down. And I tell you what, the Ronda was even darker yesterday when they lose to England. <laughs> Rugby didn't matter. I watched it and I jumped up and down and cheered and shouted. and it, it, it was downward pressure, I know it was. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to last. It's not going to help you with eternal salvation. And it's not going to change your life environment one little bit. Do you have any faith? I'm going to ask you, and then we're going to look at some mountains. Is that all right? It's a little bit of a different type of sermon, but I believe uh, uh, prophetically that God has given me 12 areas of people in this room tonight that have got mountains that need to be removed. It's going to be hard. Some of you might feel uh, emotional. Some of you might... Every, when I say it and that's you, you want to run through that door, I'd encourage you, don't run through the door. Uh, claim the removal of that mountain in Jesus' name. But do you have faith, firstly, that Jesus came, that he lived the perfect life, that he died and rose again? Because if, if, if we don't believe in Jesus, don't expect him to change your life. If you haven't surrendered and sacrificed everything to him, don't expect him to change your life. Do you believe that if you believe him, he's forgiven all of your sin? He's taken, away, he's taken away every single thing that you've ever done wrong. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Amen. Amen. And our sin is cast as far as the east is from the west and to the very depths of the sea. Amen. Amen. Come on. Do you have faith to believe that Jesus will give you a new life and a new start and that nothing is impossible with God? Believe that? Do you have the faith to believe that Jesus can remove a mountain that's in your life? Thank you.
Okay. Twelve areas. There's somebody here tonight that's got a negative self-image. Can't even look in the mirror anymore. You hate what you look like. I hate what I look like. I, I never used to look like that. I've changed. My eyes have changed. My skin has changed. My, I've got too many wrinkles. I've got a thing under my neck. I look at myself and I hate what I look like. I want to tell you that you are made in the image of God. Not, not when you were 16 and young and thin. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you were made in the image of God. And there's some of you that are here tonight that you hate what you look like. You're God's workmanship created in his image to serve and follow him. We say in the name of Jesus that mountain be removed. You can sit there and be passive, you can smile, I, I, I don't really care. I've done these 12 on myself and I had a few of them. I ain't got them now. <laughs> Woo. I look in the mirror. Whoa, you're a good looking guy. <laughs> Sharp chin. Big ear, small ears. Bit of a double chin there, some lines. That's how God wanted me to be when I was 50 years of age. Amen. You and be passive, walk out through these doors, think it's all nonsense, and stay exactly the same as when you came in. I think that's a bit of a waste of an hour and a half, to be honest. Negative self-image. In Jesus' name, we tell that mountain to be removed. And I want to give you a tester to see really if you've given that to the Lord. When you get in, first thing to do, look in the mirror. <laughs> look in the mirror. It'd be the end of the night, so you'll be looking the worst. <laughs> or look at your Facebook profile and see what picture you've put up. I haven't got to be a prophetic pastor. I've just got to have Facebook friends. Some of my friends haven't even got a picture of themselves on their Facebook profile. Negative self-image. I don't like who I am, and I don't like what God has done. In the name of Jesus, be gone. You are who you are, and God loves you as you are. Amen? And he hasn't finished with you yet. Number two, abandoned as a child. I tell you what, I shared this in the Rhonda. That was hard. In our church, no one is brought up by the parents that gave birth to them, apart from my own children. It's hard. Abandoned as a child. You feel the guilt and pain and weight of that. My dad left because I was a bad child. And sometimes the devil will reinforce that belief on top of that. My parents split up because I was born. I was an unplanned pregnancy and my mum and dad weren't ready for children. And sometimes parents say this to their children. Uh, we weren't expecting you. You were a mistake. And we couldn't handle children financially and we weren't quite ready and we split up and the child becomes a young person that young person becomes an adult and that adult becomes an older person and they live with this mountain of belief that they were a mistake and it was their fault that they, the parents split up. 
and my dad walked away and I never had a proper relationship with him again. Abandoned as a child. The devil will lay that on top of you and you'll carry that mountain throughout your whole life. The loss of a loved one. There's one thing you can be sure of in this life is that at some point, someone is going to die. And I guarantee you in a meeting that's this big, and God will honour you for coming out on a Sunday night. A lot of churches, people can't be bothered with a Sunday night. A meeting this big, you've got a lot of unordered deaths. In other words, the death of a child, the death of a young person, the suicide of a friend, someone that got cancer and they didn't survive it. You know, I've prayed for many, many people and I've laid hands on many, many people. I've anointed oil with many, many people. And you know, some live and some die. And I don't know how it works, but I do know that God is still sovereign. And that we can't blame God because God is still sovereign. God is still on the throne and God is still in control. And when we encounter loss of a loved one and we encounter grief and we encounter pain and we encounter that separation, sometimes we carry that mountain on our back and all the time we carry it. And people say, what's wrong is because so-and-so passed away. What's wrong is because so-and-so passed away. We've got to not just carry that on our backs because it will weigh us down. And it will create a heaviness. It will create a distance from God. And we say, in the name of Jesus, we ask that to be removed. Thank you. It's great having some interaction, isn't it? That's really helpful. Thank you. Number four. I didn't want to put this one first because I thought it wouldn't be popular. But I'm probably not going to be popular. Sexual problems. It's rife. <coughs> Some of the guys that I spend time with that work in the local schools. They're meeting children seven and eight and nine that are addicted to pornography. Yeah. Parents that have no control over the internet. And I tell you what, the wave of sexual dysfunction that's coming. You don't know what's coming and some of you that are older than me go, well I don't really care because it's not going to affect me. But some of you that are younger than me, it's going to affect the church of Jesus Christ and it's going to make our minds distorted in the way that we see women, in the way that we see men, in the way that we do marriage, in the way that we love one another. And ultimately the way that we connect with God. And some of you that are married have sexual problems and sexual dysfunction but it's hidden in the walls of your home and you think it's okay because this is going on and that's going on. I, I tell you, in, in the name of Jesus, I, I want to I see your marriages and your relationships and your internet use be removed. And some of us have enough, some of us don't have enough, some of us have too much and some of us get confused in all of it. And some of us have been involved in sexual activity outside of our marriages. Some of us have had affairs that we wish we'd never had. Some of us have seen things go on in our homes as children and as young people. And it becomes a mountain. Do you know why it becomes a mountain? Because things get imprinted on our minds. Imprinted on our minds. And while I'm sharing this for some of you, you're going back into that place. And you're seeing it and you're remembering it. If you see it and you remember it, it's got to go. Before I was saved, I could tell you story after story after story. And sometimes when I'd be preaching, the devil would bring to my mind things that I'd been involved in, places that I'd gone, and people that I'd been involved with. And I said every single time to the devil, in the name of Jesus, be gone. Amen. When I'd be preaching in Caldecott, uh, I'd be saying to them, hang on a minute, I've got to stop a minute, because I've just got to tell Satan to get away from me. And he put pictures into my mind. You know the blood of Christ can cleanse us from all sin. The lack of hope. 
You know, some of you have given up. Now, some of you go, oh, that's not quite the same as some of the others. But some of you have got a lack of hope. That when you look at your life and you look at your future and you look at the circle of friends and the people that you're involved with, you go, well, I, I, I haven't got much hope now. I'm over 50. I might be 55. I haven't got much hope. The opportunities that I once had have now gone. No one really listens to me anymore. I want to tell you that in Christ, you can be involved in immeasurably more than you can ask, dream, or believe of. Amen. Some of you have got a lack of hope. You were good, but now you're no good. Well, I want to tell you that in Christ you can be better in the future than you were in the past. Amen. Is that right? And until, uh, until you breathe your last breath, God can use you to reach the lost, to raise the dead, heal the demonic. Divorce. We're only on number six. Cool. I better speak faster. <laughs> Come on. Divorce. The church has always had a bit of an issue with this and has run people down and criticised people and sent people away from their churches and ignored them and turned their back on them. I want to tell you that if you've been divorced, you're welcome and God loves you. And if you've been divorced and you've gone through all the issues and the pain of separation, I want to tell you that God loves you and that he welcomes you. And that the pain of a separation of a family and two people that thought that they loved each other and in the end it didn't work out, don't wear that as a mountain on your back. Don't carry that for the rest of your life. Ask him in Jesus' name to take it away. When I uh, would do a wedding for a couple and they'd been divorced, we'd do a special service just privately, whether they were Christians or whether they weren't. And I'd pray for them and I'd lay hands on them and I'd release them from their previous marriage. Some people said to me, well, who are you? What authority have you got to do that? <laughs> I said, I come in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I come in the name of Jesus. And this couple now that love each other, that have been drawn together by God, yes, the past didn't work out, yes, things didn't, but they're not to live in the light of the failure of the past and fears of the future. What they do is they give their lives to Christ. And when you love people and when you anoint people and when you bless people, you know something changes in the heart of a man and a woman. And I can guarantee that when you do that with people, that their second marriage or their third marriage is better than their first marriage ever could have been. And I want to encourage you that if you are somebody that's been divorced, that God loves you, God welcomes you, and God will remove that mountain from your life. The seventh one is abortion. And I know that this is a tricky subject. And I know that the easiest thing for me to do in your church tonight would just be to preach a great sermon. For Ken to give me 40 quid and to drive back up to the Rhonda. <laughs> Ken, that's just a reminder. <laughs> We, we were going through a, a, a test financially and um, uh, I came and shared at the men's a curry night and we had an awesome time. My son uh, came with me. Uh, my son's in LA now serving on the streets of LA uh, as part of the Dream Center Los Angeles. It's another story but God has really touched his heart and God has really blessed him and he's out there. He contacts me every day and he's involved in loads of different things. But uh, Ken uh, came to me after the curry night and he gave me an envelope. I said, Ken, I don't need anything. I just, just, love, I just love being amongst you guys and you bless me and you encourage me. But we were going for a little bit of a financial test uh, at that moment. And I got home and I said to my wife, um, 
I didn't want the money, but Ken said we must take it. Uh, it's for petrol. We opened the envelope. What was in the envelope? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> and a few days later, Ken phoned me up and he said, I'm ever so sorry that I didn't put anything in the envelope. Do you know what? Sometimes God really does test you. He tests you with non-Christians, but he also tests you with Christians. But I laughed about that. And do you know what, Ken? I've kept the envelope because God, God really did. We were on the edge and we were going through a test in time. And do you know what? God said, I got this. I got this. And when it comes to abortion, if you've been through that journey of abortion and you, 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 you were pregnant and then you decided that it wasn't the right time and that you couldn't have it, I, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't agree with uh, abortion. But I do know that it goes on. And that as the church of Jesus Christ, we should not put our head in the sand, but we should deal with difficult issues and spend time with people that are hurt and the broken. And I would encourage you, if you've ever been on this journey, you know what, what I'm talking about and you know what this feels like. But I, in my time as a, as a pastor, 18 years, I've never met one person that thought that it was a good decision. Never met one person that thought that it was the right decision or a good decision. But it was the decision they made at that time. And when I used to take drugs and... Uh, I, I had a, an unfortunate moment where I shot a boy in the leg in a school in Birmingham. Uh, I, I, I thought that that was the right decision at that moment. <laughs> You're looking at me going, what is this guy on about? <laughs> I know now that that wasn't the right decision. <laughs> and we're not judging anyone. But we say to that mountain that some people may carry and families may carry and back in the Rhonda and back in the day, they used to send people away. Chapels that are now closed, and they deserve to be closed, used to send people away and turn young girls away that were pregnant outside of marriage. In Jesus' name, we welcome them. We love them and we bless them. Number eight, disappointments. You might have come here tonight expecting a great word. And you've gone away and you thought, oh man, why has Ken invited that bloke from the Rhonda? I'm disappointed with Ken, I'm disappointed with the, the, the leaders, and I'm never ever coming back. Well, we bless you, and we love you, but I tell you what, you're just going to be carrying a mountain. And if you carry the mountain of disappointment, and I hear people say these phrases, son, Daughter, I'm disappointed in you. And you might have said these words. Do you know what? They, the devil picks them up and he forces them like a dagger into the heart of the person. And do you know what? When they're forced like a dagger into the heart of the person, they stay there like a tattoo that you can't remove. Well, I might not be able to remove tattoos in Jesus' name. But tonight we can remove the mountain of disappointments. Number nine. Work. Some of you thought you were going to have a great job. I never thought I'd be a pastor. Some of you thought you were going to do really well in work. And then just like that, you're called into the boss's office and you're gone. And that bitter root begins to grow towards that person, towards that environment, towards that, if only I'd done better, if only I'd worked harder, if only I'd done... The mountain begins to grow and you carry that. And for those of you and in the Rhonda, if I preach this sermon, 70% of our valley is unemployed. One area of the Rhonda called Penn Reese that I got a real love for, and we got one girl in our church who recently gave her heart to the Lord from Penn Reese. 98% of Penn Reese is unemployed. 
And people carry, and a thousand people live in Penrith. People carry the mountain of unemployment with them. I'm no good. I'm worthless. I'll never amount to anything. I'm hopeless. No one will ever give me a job. And the devil just keeps going, let's push that person down. Let's push that person down. In the name of Jesus, we remove that mountain from you. And if you haven't got a job, and if you're looking for a job, we say that there may be a day when God will give you a job. And it might be a job in the church. You might be a preacher. You might be an evangelist. You might work in McDonald's, but God will give you a job. Remove that mountain in the name of Jesus. I'm going to stop at 10. I've got got another hour, it's just a (laughs) warm-up. We'll do three. Family problems. Oh man. I hate being a pastor. I love coming to random churches. I don't know anyone. So you come in to church. Hello, Ken. <laughs> Get the arms in the right position. We love you, Lord. Get out into your car, drive home. In five minutes, you're back in the argument that you left. You're back in the argument that you've left. And some of you that come to church together, you continue the argument when you get back in the car. You better not nod or shake your head because family problems. Or some of you are going to go back home and you're going to face some tough stuff. Some of you have got a wife or a a husband or a partner or you're in a relationship and they don't want you to come to church and you're going to go back home and you've got to give as much grace as you can give. And you're going to have someone that say, oh, oh, you're with the Holy Joes tonight, were you? Oh, you were clapping, oh, you were singing, were you? And there's something in you that starts to rise up. As you travel back home, ask God to give you the grace. Ask God to give you the love and the compassion for that environment that you're going into. Don't ask God to take you out of it, but ask God to remove that mountain of the pressure and oppression of a difficult family environment. Some of you might have come to church together and you've got a teenager that's just in a bad place and there's a bad atmosphere and a bad smell in your house and you just want to get out of there. I tell you what, pick a little bit of this up tonight and take it back into your home. And when you walk into your home, go in with a different feeling. Put a smile on your face, and if there's someone in there that is going to nag you, and moan at you, put you down, ridicule you, walk in, and walk in the light of Jesus Christ, and say, anyone fancy a cup of tea? Anyone fancy a cup of tea? I'm not making you one. You didn't put the check in the envelope. (laughs) Right, yeah. <laughs> I believe that when people ridicule you, mm. harass you, mm. take the mickey out of you, whatever it may be, they're not taking it out of you, they're mm. taking it out of Christ in you. That's it. Yeah, that's good. We are the carriers of Christ. Mm. If we were in the they wouldn't do it. Mm. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. And ask in Jesus' name. For that mountain to be removed. Every single night when I was a teenager, my mum used to pray in her bedroom for my salvation. I was 21 when I gave my life to Christ and I was a real rebel rouser. I was a troublemaker and I was a, a, a troubled young man. And I used to listen to my mum cry in her bedroom every single night. And I thought mum and dad were just arguing every day. And she'd be crying in the spirit for my salvation. I'm a testimony of grace before you tonight. Number 11, failure. I hear this phrase an awful lot in our churches amongst Christians. 
We tried that once and I'm never doing that again. Because it didn't work. We tried that once and I'm never doing that because it didn't work. I believe as a church that you're awesome on a Sunday. But I want to know what you're like on a Monday. I want to know what you're like on a Tuesday and as a Wednesday. I want to know what you're like on a Friday night and a Saturday night. I believe that you're an awesome church on a Sunday. But I only ever see you on a Sunday. If I went and knocked on the doors of the people, is this Edison Ridge or some strange name like that? If I went over to those flats and I said, what do those people ever do for you? The people of this church might say, well, we tried that once, but it never worked. We tried to love on the community. We tried to go out there and spend some time with them. My wife and I, we spoke to a church recently in the Rhonda, and we said, we really want to help you. We want to help you run a toddler's group. And they told us all the reasons why they couldn't run a toddler's group in their church. Last week I was talking to someone and I, they want to give us a building to run a toddler's group in. You see, when someone shuts a door, God makes sure that that door opens. You see, if you're a, if you're a believer that you've failed in the past, in Jesus' name you take away that mountain. And I want you to be like that young man on the film. I want you to get up again. And however hard it is when you've got someone on your back, when you're blindfolded and you don't know where you're going, I want you to try again. Some of you have got a heart for street work. Some of you have got a a heart for evangelism. Some of you have got a heart for... for, do Do you know our biggest problem in the Rhonda? Is battered women. That's the number one problem in the Rhonda. Is women that are abused by men. The second biggest problem is alcohol and drug use. And do you know the day that it happens the most is on Rugby International Day. And last week when we beat Scotland, I cried. As I drove through the Ronda at 11 o'clock at night to go back to my home, I cried. Because I knew that in the 85,000 people that live in the Ronda, that there would be hundreds of women that will be abused and battered in their homes. I saw the Lord last week and God showed me a a, a derelict old people's home. 100 beds, 100, 100 beds. I said, Lord, can we have that for women? Can we take women out of their homes and can we put them in that? Then God led me to a website called Eve, which is in Northampton. And I just shared the story and the problems and the difficulty. And the CEO, which is someone important, is going to get back to us. And we're going to look to partner with them. And we're going to try and open this old, this old, old, old people's home and put in there women who have been abused through the difficulties and pain of alcohol. I, 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 and we're believing for that. Now, we can't live in failure. I've tried stuff before and it hasn't worked. I've tried stuff in this place and in that place. And now God is beginning to open doors. Try again. Get up again. Ask God to say, where do I go? What do I do? Don't quit. Don't shrink back. Don't hold back. Just summon that faith of a mustard seed. And you can see the mountain removed. Now I... I haven't got all the faith. We just use the faith that we're given. But you know, once I see God work in one thing, I believe for the next thing. Amen? Amen. Once you see God work in one thing, you believe for the next thing. Yesterday as a church, we gave away £500 to Message Wales. They're doing a higher tour and they're doing some work with young people in Newport and Cardiff and the Valleys. We haven't got £500 as a church, but I just said, we've got to do it. It's on my heart, and I had £500 in my head. Not in my pocket, in my head. (laughs) My wife had the same £500 in her head. We give £500. Yesterday, gave £500. Bank transfer, gone. By the evening, we got £1,000 come back into the church bank account. (laughs) 
A church in Porth Call gave us £500 and a charity that I'd never heard of gave us £500 from Hereford. I don't know. But if we live in failure and fear and not faith, we'll never see change. And when I look at that broken down building in the Rhonda uh, and the roof is okay and the walls are okay but the windows are all smashed in and there's been drug addicts living in there and goodness knows what. When I look at that building, I could look at it with fear, failure or faith. And when Jesus looks at you, he looks at you with faith and the belief that you can be transformed. And finally, fear. This is too hard. I can't do this. This is too hard. This is too difficult. We don't have the people. We don't have the resources. We don't have the skills. What do the people out there say? What if Muslims say nasty things to us? What if the Satanists start to come? And in the Rhonda, we've got a lot of Satanists, but I believe that what is in us is greater than what's in them. We're not going to be fearful. We're not going to shrink back. And when Daniel's friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, were thrown into the fire, what did they say? Our God will deliver us. But even if he does not, He is still God. That's it. Nothing else. I've been in. a lot of meetings. <laughs> and I don't want this to be a, a fake meeting. So, if any of those were you, don't walk out the door and say, I'll do it later. I tell you 100% you won't. 100% you won't. That's the devil saying to you, don't, don't do anything now. People might see. What will people think about you? Deal with it now. Band, have you got anything else you can do? Um, Perhaps if you come and just play and we'll invite people forward, is that all right? Um, And if if you need to go, um, please go. It's great to have the little children. I had little children once, but they got big. Uh, Thank you for bringing your children to church. It's just amazing to so I love children in church, don't you? Love the children. So band if you come out and just start to play. And um, if people want to come forward, if you want prayer, um, if you want to get sort this out with God now, uh, put a marker in the sand. Hello. <laughs> want to share?